Hey guys, so before we jump into this interview, I wanna give you a little bit of context of what this video is all about. So this video was originally published in my course called Mental Mastery for Traders and Investors, which is all about helping people up their mental game so they can be more confident when investing in financial markets. So my buddy Travis that I'm interviewing in this video spent the last eight years working at hedge funds and at his last company, he helped them grow from about a hundred million dollars to over a billion dollars in assets under management and they were consistently ranked among the top performing hedge funds in the world and after retiring from the hedge fund industry at a really young age he's actually decided to come on board the skill incubator as a mentor and I wanted to share this interview with you because I thought it was so powerful because most people just don't have access to guys like Travis or people that have been rock stars in the hedge fund industry so uh, without any further ado do let's go ahead and jump into the interview hey guys so this is Chris back with you and I'm here with my good buddy Travis DeVitt hey guys um, so Travis I'll let Travis introduce himself in a second but um, just to tell you why I kind of wanted to do an interview with him is because he is used to managing hundreds of millions of dollars um, and so he's had a perspective in the institutional trading and investing world that a lot of people just don't get uh, but it doesn't matter if you're like brand new to trading and you're just managing your own account or if you're managing a multi-billion dollar hedge fund, we're humans, right? And people all experience a lot of the same emotions and stuff like that. And so, you know, we just finished up wake surfing and I was like, man, this is the perfect time to do an interview and just talk a little bit about the markets. And so thanks for being here, brother. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, um, I guess just kind of give a little bit of perspective on your background and wh how you've traded and then maybe we can dive into some, you know, some of the most common mistakes that you've seen people make, even, you know, people that are supposed to be the top level professional traders and investors. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, I came up a uh, pretty, pretty traditional blue chip route, um, you know, interned at all the right places, interned at Goldman, worked for a, um, an institutional asset allocator that was picking hedge funds to invest in. And then, um, and then out of school, um, after majoring in finance, I actually started working for hedge funds. So, um, yeah, I mean, we were we were taking um, you know pretty big positions um, by the time uh, you know by the time I was done with the with the last fund, we had uh, over a billion dollars worth of capital that we were managing. Nice, and you guys were one of the top performing funds for several years. We were, yeah, we made Barron's top one hundred global hedge funds list. I think two or three years uh, running um, towards the end of my tenure there. Nice, yeah. and so I guess give a little perspective on the trading or investing style, like um, you know what types of markets you were in, what the time frame was position sizes, that kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we were focused on pretty, uh, you know, fundamentally driven investments. So we would do a lot of deep research work uh, looking for, um, you know, very, very undervalued kind of opportunities that were missed by the market. And we would take big positions. So we were really concentrated. You know, we might take anywhere between a, um, a five and a 15% position in a company, which, you know, when you're managing a billion dollars could be a hundred million dollar position. So yeah. you can imagine the, the, um, you know, the, the position sizes get pretty big and the investments get pretty significant um, when you are managing that kind of money um, and you're, you're potentially even moving markets in some cases. So um, you really have to have a really good pulse on um, what's happening in these investments that you're, that you're doing. So you really have to care um, about every little detail almost about, you know, what's happening there, so. Yeah, and so what would you say are like, some of the biggest mistakes that you've seen on the mental side people make that are managing those types of positions. Yeah, that's the, that's the, the interesting thing about it is in, you know, I got to know a lot of um, a lot of other hedge fund analysts and hedge fund portfolio managers and founders um, while being in that uh, environment, because you, you know, you talk, you tend to talk about positions that you overlap on with other funds, you trade research, you, you know, give each other ideas, you see each other at management meetings and conferences and things like that. So um, you follow what other people in the industry are doing on the professional side. And uh, it's amazing to see that, you know, what you see in the professional world is actually the same types of mistakes that you'll see individual investors make. You know, when mm -hmm. I was starting out trading, you know, options and penny stocks when I was in college, you know, I was making the same dumb mistakes that I saw actually a lot of institutional money managers make, which is kind of amazing. So they're not gods. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, there's a reason why, you know, something like, you know, like 75% of active money managers don't beat the stock market indexes, yeah. right? So, so what's the key then to outperforming the market can consistently. 
Yeah, so I think there's a couple keys, right? And and a lot of this revolves around being able to understand the, the like psychological uh, mistakes that investors make and seeing similar patterns across different market cycles. And so, um, you know, I, I'd say there's a there's a couple things that you that you must do, right? You you've got to, you know, there's this old uh, like the old tr tried and true statement about mar investing in the market, which is buy low, sell high. And it sounds like such an easy thing, but it's yeah. actually really not because what you see is you see investors, uh, you know, even as a group, dumping stocks at their lows and, and and buying stocks when things are euphoric and things have already risen. And yep. so um, you see that in the hedge fund world, they call it actually hedge fund hotels, which is what happens when a position becomes so sexy that like all the hedge funds own it. 90% of the ownership of the company is by hedge funds. And so mm. I would tend to see this a lot with, um, you know, a stock like, uh, let's say, you know, Facebook, right? Um, Facebook is a stock, I think in the last year that, uh, you know, has, has obviously had a lot of great business fundamental success and is doing a lot of things right. But, you know, people then get into the stock after three or four years of great Facebook stock performance, and they expect that to continue for another five, 10, 15 years. And, you know, they bid it up to unsustainable levels. They start to like take risks, um, you know, and getting in stocks that they don't maybe haven't done deep research on just because everybody else is, is smart is in the stock, you know? Yeah, so it's, yeah. So um, does it become something like if everybody, meaning like all the big hedge funds are in a position and you're not, you kind of feel left out or like, are we doing something wrong? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, there is that herd mentality of like, you, you're sort of like drawn to what others are talking about. Um, and actually what you should be doing is the opposite. You know, that's the, the biggest key for us as a fund in terms of outperforming all the other funds was let's go look where no one else is looking. Mm -hmm. Let's go do work in the places where no one else is doing work. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times that doesn't turn up really interesting opportunities, but when it does, it's really, really powerful. Because so, you're, you're usually like the first one to find it and the first one in. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we want to find those stocks that can go up two, three, five, ten 10 X. And, you know, if, if that stock is already up 500% over the last three years, it's probably not going to be another 10 bagger over the next couple of years. Because right? who else is there going to be that can come in, right? Exactly. And, and that, that's kind of the, the hard part, I think, for a lot of people is like, how low is low? and how high is high, right? Like the greater fool theory, you know, a stock might be up some, but who's to say it's not gonna run another thousand percent or something, right? Yeah, and that, there is a flip side to that coin, which is, you know, winners do tend to run. There is a momentum as a strategy tends to continue to work over like long market cycles. Yeah. And, and so people, people, uh, the momentum traders do, you know, they have some success in a lot of these positions by buying what's already been working. Yeah. But there's a point at which that stops working. When so, there's no more greater fools. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, for us, it was all about finding stocks before they had broken out um, so that we could capture the meat of those breakouts. And, um, you know, we didn't care about trying to play the momentum game and get that last 25% out of a hot stock. We wanted to be first in to get the 10 baggers. Um, and so, yeah, we had a lot of success doing that. And you have to be careful too, not to, uh, you know, not to like fool yourself and, and, and um, you know, <laughs> be in areas that are really unattractive, you have to be careful not to let yourself, like for instance, go like be buying junior mining stocks in Canada just because no one's there. Sometimes there is a reason that no one's there. Right, right. Um, <laughs> so something might be undervalued for a good reason and yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a buying opportunity that's gonna pop 10X. Yeah, yeah. So I think what you're really looking for um, in, in these types of scenarios is finding, especially situations where there's a lot of like change occurring where the market's not paying attention yet. So yeah. maybe there was a management change and that manager uh, is, is you know creating new growth opportunities for the company. Company. Maybe the company started buying back a lot of their stock. You know, mm. maybe there was an activist investor that got involved. Um, you know, maybe the industry's consolidated and now like a couple of players have gone bankrupt and the existing players that are left are now going to do very, very well. So it's finding these opportunities where um, th there's, there's a fundamental change that people haven't quite picked up on. Gotcha. And so let's talk about like buying dips or buying panic. Like, you know, that's something that can be profitable like if a, if a market or a stock or a coin or something is crashing like you know it's hard to have confidence to to just go heavy especially if you're trading with a large position size when things are crashing like what what do you look for to give you confidence to actually pull the trigger on something like that yeah yeah so obviously you know doing a lot of deep work and really like um getting an understanding of 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 what's happening um 
you know, at a fundamental level, but also really seeking out the other side too, the bear case and figuring out how could I be wrong? That's mm. actually one thing where we made some mistakes early on at our fund that we really had to learn, you know, through some painful losses um, that, you know, there's a, there's a, um, a bias among, um, really among everyone that um, you only seek out information that confirms your existing beliefs, right? Right, right. And so you see that in politics, you see that in, in investing. It's a, you know, it's a, a pretty- Confirmation bias, basically. Exactly, yeah, yeah, confirmation bias, that's exactly right. So, you know, we have to be careful not to only seek out the information that confirms our thesis. So if we think, if we start to get bullish on a stock and we've done some work, um, we'll, we'll have a starter position that we start, but then we go out and we continue to do work and we say, you know, what's the bear thesis? How could we be wrong? Mm. Okay. What are, are there people short this stock? Let's see if we can go find them and talk to them. Mm. Um, and so, so that's actually a thing reaching out and being like, Hey, I'm long, you're short. Let's yeah. fight it out. Like, what does that look like? That can be tricky. Um, and that's something that <laughs> where, when you call another fund, um, you know, hopefully you have some uh, relationships with them that you've that you've built before, uh, and there are other positions maybe where you cross over on the same side. But occasionally, you know, sometimes those people are willing to talk to you as well because they want to know what the bull thesis is. So mm. um, if they're a good fund, they want to know what you think and the research that you've done, and vice versa. And so yeah, so that would be really helpful at times to go out and seek that kind of information out from other funds. There are other ways to do that too, though. You can go. You can go hire consultants. You can go find people in the industries of the companies that you're looking at, um, and you can you can go and ask them questions about that industry and get a better, deeper sense of are you right or wrong on your thesis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can't go you can't go to it like if you're in the stock market and you're investing in a company, you can't go talk to an executive at that company. That's insider information, but you might be able to go find the VP who left a year ago who knows that business or knows that industry. Um, and can tell you a lot about what's going on at the ground level and, gotcha. and things that you might be wrong about or right about. Awesome. So, yeah, I mean, I, I love that idea of like just not buying into your own idea too much. And I, I kind of look at it like thinking in terms of like possibilities, like everything that could happen and then trying to weigh the probabilities and not just looking for a reason that you're right. right? Yeah. And I think a lot of traders, especially like newer people that are on social media trying to impress one another, you know, they just like are, are fighting and telling each other why they're wrong. And I actually like to use that information to kind of get a sense of market sentiment, you yeah. know, because when you see emotions flying. Um, so that's one thing. Cool. So what, what other big mistakes or what other biases or, or big problems have you seen in that world? Yeah, well, you know, I think there's there there are things like you know hindsight hindsight bias where um, you start to you know you look at your your past mistakes and you and you start to see well what if I had bought the stock here or what if I had you know waited and sold the stock you know at its high and that can create when you start to do that and you start to beat yourself up over these missed opportunities it can often make you you know really too aggressive on your next positions. Mm. And, and the thing about hindsight, hindsight bias is, look, you're just never going to always nail the very bottom and the very top. Like yeah. it's, it's almost, you know, it's so rare that you're ever going to buy um, a stock or a crypto coin at, at like the very bottom and then sell it at the very top. So, you know, we talk about this a lot, being, being able to catch the meat of the move and, and being happy with, you know, taking gains along the way. Yep. Um, and so, you know, you can't let you can't let hindsight hindsight bias affect your future decisions about investing. It's like, oh well, if I had just you know had triple the position size, and then you go you know triple your next position size, and it's not the right thing to do, right? And you lose money. Um, you know, those are the kind of mistakes that can really affect you. Um, I would say, you know, other things like um, you know really you know being being too active in the market is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a bias towards acting, you know, especially in like choppy or sideways, sideways markets really eats you up in several ways, right? It eats you up in terms of fees, which, mm -hmm. hurt, which, hurt, which hurt your compounding over time. Um, and, you know, it leads you to potentially making investments that you shouldn't make. And so I think um, really being patient is, is a big part of, um, you know, like outperforming. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that's another one. Nice. So how would you guys find an idea and then have the confidence to put a hundred million dollars down. Like what is it consensus? Is it one person making that decision? And is it kind of a meritocracy where like the best idea wins? And how, how do you like, how do you really value opinions and then come to a consensus on where to 
actually deploy that amount of capital. Yeah, I think different funds handle this differently. Some do it by committee. Some, you know, a lot of people will have an investment committee where uh, I actually was at a fund for about a year and a half that did this, where um, an analyst would go work on something and do the work and they would present it at the investment committee uh, the next week and the investment committee as a whole would kind of vote on it. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I don't necessarily believe that's the, the right way to do it. I think you have to have someone who has a lot of experience as a portfolio manager ultimately making like the go, no go call. Gotcha. Um, and, and so, especially when you're an analyst early on in your career, I think it's really easy to, um, you know, to get excited about what you're working on and to take bigger positions than you should take and do things that you wouldn't do as a more experienced person who's taken their lumps in the market and been yeah. through multiple market cycles. So I like to have like a really experienced portfolio manager. Now, if you're an individual, um, you know, the way that you would apply that was, you know, you would, you would, um, you know, obviously you should probably size your positions, um, you know, a little bit smaller starting out when you're like less experienced because mm -hmm. you can always get more aggressive, right? Um, it's the losses that really kill you, the permanent capital losses. Um, I think we've talked about this before. Yeah, and, and let's let's explore that. So like, let's say you guys get into a position and then over the next two weeks or two days even, the, the stock starts crashing against you if you're long. Like, how do you handle that? And when do you cut a loss? And when do you hang on for dear glory? <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's such a hard thing to get right too because there are people that tell you, you know, cut your, cut your losers early and yeah. let your winners run. And I think that's a great strategy in general. Yeah. Um, but there is such a thing as like cutting your losses, you know, just because there's market volatility um, and that hurts you. And so you have to, you have to really walk that fine balance between um, when a stock's really moving against you and it's a big position, it doesn't hurt to size it down and then go do work to figure out what it is you don't know. So you don't cut the position off completely. Maybe you close, yeah. what, 50% or 75% yeah, or something? Yeah, and then there are also times too where it may make sense if you have, if you've been in a position for 18 months and you know it so deeply and you can understand that there's a, um, a short-term reason why it's selling off, let's say, there's um, you know, a manager who just left the company and he's selling his shares, or there's, um, uh, you know, there's macroeconomic um, headlines about something totally unrelated to the stock, mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it's just causing it to get sold off. In those cases, you can probably hold on to your position without cutting any, maybe even buy more. You know, sometimes yeah. we would really take advantage of uh, buying dips that were just silly market dips that was, you know, punishing all stocks. Just overreactions, something global that happened to affect that stock, but wasn't that stock specific. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then so, you're like, at that point, you're like, oh, I'm, I can get it at a discount. It's absolutely. not that I'm wrong about my idea. And and that's, I think, a, a, a kind of a catch-22 for some people is like, you hear all these cliches in trading, right? Like, cut your, your losses off quickly, let your winners run. But like, in some cases, it does make sense to double down, yeah. right? Like, if you get in at a certain price, like, how would you know if like, okay, our thesis is still intact and it makes sense to buy lower versus like, okay, yeah. we were wrong, let's cut it. Yeah, sometimes uh, one of the signals that I think is often useful is uh, levels of volume. So if, if your stock is selling off um, and it's super low volume, mm -hmm. um, then it can often be a signal that there's a there's a forced seller here um, and he's just having to sell it at lower, lower prices. And there's, there's actually, you know, there aren't, very many sellers here there may be one or two sellers and they're just for selling the thing and so if the volume's you know relatively low relative like to its historical just like volume, a slow grind yeah just a low volume yeah exactly yeah. so you can sometimes um you know pick up pick up that um hey there's this selling pressure isn't really overwhelming from uh you know there's lots of investors getting out it's more yeah. of a there's some just you know, daily for selling happening, or maybe retail investors getting impatient because again, a lot of a lot of times those psychological bi biases that you see in the markets where you know people are selling at the lows, you can take advantage of that. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think volume's a signal. There are other signals. Um, you know, I think that um, if you see insiders buying stock, that's usually a pretty good signal that hey, the stock may be down, but if management and the board believe that their stock super undervalued and they're actually using their own money to buy back the stock, mm -hmm. that's a pretty clear signal that maybe we should be buying it too and doubling down. Um, but it, you know, part of it too depends on how big of a position it is in your portfolio. If it's already a 10 or 15% position in your portfolio, you may not have room to increase that further. 
Um, and so you sort of just have to bite your teeth and continue to make sure that there's not anything happening that you don't understand yeah. um, and just kind of ride through. Um, and there is something to be said about that and having the fortitude to ride through dips. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. To, to have confidence and not get shaken out and, and not panic sell the low if, you're, if your thesis is still intact, right? Yeah. So how, let's talk about like managing, because you know, when you're working at a hedge fund, you're managing other people's capital, but mm -hmm. you also trade your own portfolio. Um, have you noticed any mental differences or execution differences for you bet between the two? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think as um, you know, as an institutional investor, the bar is higher in terms of the amount of work, the research um, before you actually go put someone else's capital at risk. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a bit more diversification too once you get to that institutional level. Like we would, we would have between I think ten and thirty positions on the long side. Mm -hmm. Whereas in my personal portfolio, um, you know, I'm willing to be five, six positions, you know, with a 20%. Fully deployed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Potentially with a, you know, 20% position size if, if something is is really a, a screaming buy for me. So mm -hmm. so you can handle more volatility, bigger drawdowns, bigger spikes. Yeah, yeah. And that's just, you know, that's a personal risk tolerance. Yeah. Um, uh, but but the thing about institutional investing too is you get you get better access. So, um, you know, you can you can do deeper work. You can pay for resources that an individual wouldn't necessarily have. Like what kind of? Well, you, you can actually go have management meetings. You don't mm -hmm. sometimes you don't have to pay. You just call up the investor relations and you say, hey, you know, we're a billion dollar fund. We own a five percent position in your company. You They're know. going to take that meeting. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so there's some things you can do, uh, you know, on an institutional level that you can't do as an individual, and so. In fact, that would actually argue the opposite of what I was just saying, which is as a as an individual, maybe your position shouldn't be as large. Yeah. Um, uh, unless you are really confident in your research and, and somebody like you, I mean, you you know what you're doing. So, yeah, I think that's the difference. And and I mean, if you look at someone like Warren Buffett and their track and his track record um, and read some of his writings, you know, he talks about um, the benefits of being uh, a very concentrated uh, portfolio. Um, and, and how that gives you the opportunity to really like outpace the market. You know, mm -hmm. if the market's doing 8% a year on average, you know, Buffett was doing 25, 30% early days because he was, at times he only had five or six positions. And so, um, you know, being concentrated really allows you to well, you know, outperform your benchmark, but you have to really know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, again, I, we said this earlier, but when you, early on, when you're kind of learning and getting into your first few years of investing, your position size just should be smaller. Yeah. Yeah, and grow with confidence and, and never take on a size that could be account crippling. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, when you when you lose 50% in your account, you've got to double your account then just to get back to break even, right? Yeah. If you yeah. lose 75%, you've got to be up 300% the next year to break even. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it, The losses are uh, asymmetric relative yeah. to, to gains. So there's there's several different time frames that you could be a trader or investor. Everything from like a scalper and a, a day trader that drank too much coffee to like a swing trader who's in a position for a couple of days to a couple of months to position where it's what, a year to three or four years and then long-term multi-decade. Like what what is kind of your sweet spot and and why do you like that sweet spot? Yeah, yeah, my sweet spot I would say is somewhere between like six months and two years. And it's not that I have a hard rule, it's just that um, I think the market opportunities that the stock market gives me tends to be in that range. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I tend to find things that um, are really, really undervalued and can get discovered or have a catalyst that can you know move the stock within a year to two years. And so, um, I'm looking specifically for stocks that can double in two years okay. or better. Gotcha. And so, um, yeah, and uh, I think it would be difficult to find stocks, you know, to consistently find stocks that double, you know, every, you know, in a month or two months. Yeah. But on a six month, 24 month time frame, that's kind of my sweet spot. Yeah. And, you know, there's been a lot of research about, and I have personal opinions about like day trading and just that hyperactive, like over trading that so many new folks want to do because they think they can make more money doing that. Yeah. But like, you know, and as the markets have evolved over the past 15 years that I've been in them, like it's become exponentially more difficult to make money day trading because of the competitive environment and stuff. Like what, why do you think kind of that that one to two year time frame or, or something like that is so beneficial and and do you think that would be a good kind of zone for a newer investor or trader yeah i think so 
Um, that zone, I think there's, there's something to uh, be said about uh, what a lot of investors will refer to as time arbitrage. It's not a true arbitrage, but when they talk about time arbitrage, uh, what they mean is most investors um, are focused on the very short term. What's happening this quarter? What are the numbers going to be this quarter, next quarter? And so if you can take a view on what a company's earnings power will look like two to three years from now, then you know, you're know you potentially able to buy companies based on a little bit longer uh, outlook. Mm -hmm. And so that can help you actually overcome um, and take advantage of like short-term dips and short-term opportunities. Um, it's kind of amazing actually, you know, I looked at data on uh, for 2017 on the top 1,000 largest U.S. stocks. And the average change from the year's low to the year's high, uh, the average among all 1,000 of those stocks was, four, was 40%. So your average wow. stock in the U.S. stock market was, um, you know, between its low during the year and its high during the year, there was a 40% spread. So there is a ton of opportunity um, in stocks in any given year to take advantage of, you know, dips and, yeah. and buy opportunities. Um, you know, that average, you know, there are companies that are very, very stable or growing earnings very significantly. And they're seeing, you know, even Google, Google had, I think, five double digit retracements during 2017. Mm. And that, that's a company that whose fundamentals isn't changing that quickly. But yeah. uh, those are the kinds of opportunities that you have continuously uh, in the markets. So, uh, sorry, I forget the question. No, 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 that's perfect. <laughs> I mean, I, I, that's kind of what I was alluding to is like there, there's so much opportunity um, and you don't have to be hyperactive about it, right. right? Like you can be patient. And like I hammer this over and over in our trading room is trade less, profit more. Like doing more doesn't mean you're going to make more money. It, it just opens you up to more potential mistakes, over trading, like you said, more fees. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, that's why I really like your style and, and your methodology of just finding those things that could double or triple in that kind of sweet spot time frame. And if you get a, a basket or a portfolio of those. And then let, let's say hypothetically and just kind of ballpark numbers, let's say you have 10 stocks and, and you like those types of plays, like in an average market, how many of those stocks do you think will perform like you expected uh, across, you know, d a decade, but like on average? On average across, so if a portfolio like that, um, well, I would say there's probably, I, I think there's probably, I could I could consistently find somewhere between three and five of those opportunities each year. So, um, you know, I think, so, and how do you mean in terms of, um, you know, average? Do you I, mean I guess, like, I guess like, say you have 10 trades, right? 10 investments. Okay. And how many of those will usually go on to do what you expect and like, and do I the see. double or triple, how many of them will be like break evens and how many of them like something fundamentally will change and you'll like be like, no, we have to bail out of this and take this loss. Yeah, I would say seven out of 10 is, is kind of the batting average that I'm, that I'm shooting for. Nice. Um, I'd say in, historically we've been able to, um, to hit that level. Um, but yeah, I mean, even if you were doing, if you had a portfolio of stocks that had a expected, you know, double to triple uh, digit returns, you know, in, in over a six to 24 month time frame, um, your batting average does not have to be high. It could probably be 50% and yeah. that portfolio will beat the market. Yeah. Um, and you don't even have to be fully invested actually for that portfolio to be the market. That, that's kind of what I was alluding to. And we, we've talked about some of the stuff in, in Cayman Islands where we did our uh, seminar down there. And, you know, it, like you said, it doesn't take much to beat the market, but at the same time, it doesn't take much to really screw it up and lose <laughs> yeah. money either. So. Well, yeah, let's put it this way. I mean, if you have a 10% position in a stock and it doubles, you've just made 10% on your entire portfolio, right? Yep. So that 10% just turned into a 20% position. Um, and so if you just had one double every year, you would essentially beat the S&P's 8% annual average, yeah. long-term average. Now, sometimes you may underperform the market because it may be up 15 or 20 that year, uh, but hopefully you don't just have one 10% position that's doubling, you have a couple of those every year. And that doesn't sound like a lot, right? Like a 2% a beat of the market, but if you compound that over a decade or two or three, that is a significant amount of money. Yeah. 
And, yeah. and I think a lot of people are just too short-sighted, right? Like people that come into the financial markets and like look at them as a way to make quick money. Yeah. 99% of those people lose money. And I mean that literally, like I was just reading this study that the University of California put out that showed that only after seven years, only 1% of active individual traders are still going. Yep, that makes sense. Uh, Bezos, there's a, I don't even know if this is true, but Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, uh, was reportedly talking to Warren Buffett a decade ago, and, and he said, you know, Warren, how have you been able to do this? And Warren told him, well, most people don't want to get rich slowly. You know, Warren Buffett's like the second or third richest man in the world, right? Yeah. Uh, but he's done it by compounding at a decent rate of return year after year after year for 40 years. Yeah. And that's, you know, getting rich slow. I, I love that, um, that phrase because, you know, everyone wants to get rich quick, right? But it's just, that's really difficult to do without taking on excessive risk. Yeah. And, yeah, people um, don't understand like with reward comes risk. Yeah. They, you can't have one without the other. Yeah. Okay, so now it's time for the fire round where Trav's gonna just do a whole bunch of do's and don'ts. He's got a list prepared for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number one, don't. Don't listen to the experts on CNBC or on financial TV. Don't even have that channel on yeah. because it unless is, it's pure entertainment, but right? Even then, it could like distract you and make you like over manage a trade or it's something. It's just so much noise, and they are so wrong so many times. Yeah, um, I think Kramer's um, like people like track his predictions. I think he's yeah. less than thirty percent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there are websites out there that track it. It is horrendously bad. You would do better throwing darts at a at a dartboard. But try they have suits on. Man. They look so. <laughs> Actually, my favorite I think was Ripple when they like literally said how to buy they. They had a thing on how to buy it like at $3 yeah. and then they had to sell it at what, like 60 cents? Yeah, we, we literally counter traded that. It was uh, unreal. Yeah, anyway. Okay, do attempt to seek out opposite viewpoints. Uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, you know, you really have to go figure out um, what you don't know. You know, you're, you should be constantly thinking about um, how can I get more confidence around my positions? How can I keep up to date? Because the world changes quickly and things change. Um, so you really have to like just be constantly looking for um, information and make sure that what you're doing and what's in your portfolio is is the right thing. And don't be afraid to go against the herd, right? Like if yeah. everybody around you is telling you you're wrong, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Right, yeah, that's true. Um, don't take analyst forecasts as gospel. So this is especially true in the stock market. You've got these sell side analysts that work for banks like you know, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan. Um, what, what does that mean, buy side, sell side for anybody? So mean? yeah, good good, good question. So the buy side is typically people who actually manage money and are, and, are in, and are investing in positions to try to grow portfolios. So that would be like hedge funds, private equity firms, uh, you know, people who actually manage the money. Sell side are banks that try to help companies raise capital. So this would be your Goldman Sachs, your Bank of America, your JP Morgan, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley's of the world. They actually go out and um, they help uh, uh, companies do IPOs and help them raise debt and equity capital, but they also have a research arm where they put out research. Now, the problem with that research is that it's extremely biased towards basically getting the deals from those companies. Mm -hmm. So let's say that there's a company that uh, actually has like really terrible near-term prospects. Uh, a sell-side analyst will often have a buy recommendation on that because they actually want to get that company's business when that company needs to go raise new capital in the market. So. Sell side analysts are notoriously bad at predicting, um, you know, investment returns. They typically, they also usually justify their price targets by however the stock is trading in the market. So, if they have a hundred dollar price target on a stock and the stock goes to one twenty, all of a sudden they'll bump their price targets up just because the stock went up, not because they believe it's worth one twenty. Yeah, they they have like a different type of skin in the game, right? Like guys like you that are actually yeah. managing money, your skin in the game is making the right decisions. For them, their skin in the game is selling more stock or or making deals happen. So it's all about like what they're ulterior motives are. Yeah, yeah, so beware uh, and don't necessarily follow those sell side analysts blindly. Um, so another do would be, you know, do take advantage of others' psychological mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, um, I love it when people are panicking and running yes. for the, the exit at the same time and you just sit there and go, yeah. And that's my favorite time to buy. Buying when there's panic is the best. I mean, 2008 was a horrible year for, for many, many people in lots of ways. And I don't wish a 2008 on, on you know, your average human, but when those environments do happen and they will, they will continue to, um, hopefully you set, you have some cash and you can, you can have 
um, you know, generational buying opportunities. Because if you're not fully invested and you've been prudent and you've been, uh, you know, really waiting out those euphoric times, then when there's a panic that happens, that's when you can get really, really wealthy. We, we were buying, uh, at the hedge fund, we were buying like first lien loans on companies for 40 cents on the dollar. Companies that were like still doing pretty well, that weren't going bankrupt. And we like could mortgage buy, type stuff? We could buy their, their first lien secured debt. So mm -hmm. we're talking about like, if there was ever a bankruptcy with a company, they were the first ones to get paid out of liquidation, whether that you know was selling the company's assets off or if the company was reorganized and those, those lenders would get all the equity in the new company. So first lien debt rarely um, takes huge losses. Mm -hmm. um, I think like um, if you look over an average over like many years over many companies, like first lien debt, uh, even in bankruptcy situations tends to get like 70 or 80 cents on the dollar recoveries. Um, and so we were buying first lien debt at 40 cents on the dollar of companies we didn't think even had a chance of going bankrupt. So we thought these 40 cent loans were going to be worth 100 plus cents and we had at hard assets backing them this was 2008 yeah. during the bloodbath yeah or another or another way to put it would be there were stocks that were trading for like three times earnings um which is which is just crazy so you know do take advantage of like panic selling when you get those you know opportunities they don't they don't come around very often but when they do it can change your life yep. yeah i mean Absolutely. that's what happened bitcoin 2015 for me you know everybody had panicked out it, it, it was at 200 nobody wanted to talk about it that was the time to make a That's ton of money yep. yep absolutely yeah so uh another don't is you know don't chase investments that are just loved by like everyone else um you know this this goes back to i think what we were talking about at the very beginning where um Especially, you know, there's there's this bias in the media towards like hot stocks, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, Tesla right now or um, Apple. Um, you know, there's like five stocks like that financial media or people are talking about in any given month. Yeah. Um, and all the attention and all the articles in the press are written about them. Um, don't fall into that trap. You know, go go again. Like look in the places where no one's looking. Mm. Go figure out like. You know, are people, uh, you know, is the uranium market or, you know, or whatever it may be, right? It, maybe it's um, maybe it's an underloved IPO that um, is down 30% from its IPO price and no one's paying attention and there's not much trading volume. Or, uh, you know, maybe it's a, an old industry um, like steel because like no one thinks about steel anymore. All they think about is like social media stocks, right? Yeah. Um, so find the stuff that's gonna be hot yeah. a year or two from now. Yeah, and you they can get in on the sly when nobody's paying attention. Yeah, in crypto, maybe that's you know maybe that's some like unloved projects that really under the underneath the the scenes there's a lot happening in terms of development. Right? Yeah, or, yeah, where there's a real team behind it, they're solving a real problem, and yeah. nobody's paying attention to them because depending on the day, week, month, or year, everybody's either super excited about crypto or super down and depressed about it. And yeah. that that volatility is amazing if you know how to get on the right side of those markets. Yep. And I noticed too in the crypto markets something that happened in the stock market in 2008, which is everything's down. Everything's so correlated, it's all moving directionally down together. Yep. Um, on the next up cycle, there will, be, there will be investments that outperform the rest. And so if you can find them now, those are their like 10x, 100x potential um, you know, projects or investments um, that you're gonna wanna own. So if you can find those now and do the work now and buy them cheaply when they're getting sold off just like everything else, that's that's fantastic boom love it yeah uh i see, let's see the last uh do is um well i think we just talked about it actually seek out uncommon areas for investments so that's the flip side of not chasing investments that's loved by others awesome yeah awesome so any final advice for anybody that is let's say just getting started and they're like i don't know what to do should i just buy some index funds should i start researching what, what would you say is a good kind of kickoff point? Well, I would say go educate yourself. Mm -hmm. So I would say first, just spend some time learning. Um, index funds can't um, can't hurt you too bad usually. I think the markets are, you know, not undervalued now, but they're probably not you know super overvalued like they were in 1999 or 2000. But um, so index funds are okay if you want if you need some place to park money for a while. Um, cash is also okay though. I yeah. mean, I think you can have your money sit in cash for a few months, 
flat well, is a position too, right? Absolutely. Like you don't have to be long or short to be active if you're paying attention and hunting for opportunities, right? Yeah, yeah. But the big thing is use this time to go educate yourself and figure out, um, you know, what are, what are the things that you need to know about investing? Um, we've got we've got resources that can help you with that. Yep. And um, yeah, just never stop learning in general, really, because even even the best of the best are humbled by the markets. Um, yep. So um, even if you do feel like you are fairly far along, um, go find out what the best uh, investors are doing. Go find out what they're thinking about, how the markets are evolving because they're always evolving. Yep, absolutely. One final question for you is how do you handle either revenge trading or feelings of tilt or rage or just anger in the market where you're like, man, I, I knew I was right on this and like people just don't see what I see or it didn't react the way that you wanted it to. If, if you, A, do you ever get caught up and, and catch yourself feeling that way? And if, if so, what do you do about it? Yeah, Ooh, yeah, that's tough. Um, there there definitely been a couple times uh, where, that, where that has happened. Um, <laughs> for some reason it usually happens on the short side where I'm short something and it gets acquired by some dumb acquirer. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean there's some really great stories about this like um, you know HP acquired a company a couple years back where um, you know for for like a 50% premium and a bunch of hedge funds were short. Turned out the company was actually a fraud and HP had to write the entire investment off two years later. So it was like you were right but you still got burned. You got squeezed. Yeah so that. like the short side is really tough. You have a lot of those moments where you're like this doesn't make sense. People are being stupid. Like the management team is lying. There's fraud here. And yet the yeah. stock continues to go up. Um, I think, you know, <clears throat> part of, part of what I do in that situation is like, I either, um, I either, you know, kind of like, basically remove myself for a while from that like position, or I go like do more work to try to figure out like, you know, what can I do to, um, you know, to get away from the emotional side of it and get more into like the logical, like, okay, um, in the research phase, like, what can I do to actually, ah, fuck, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> no, that, that makes on. sense, man. I mean, I, I think the, the biggest thing, right, is I'm like drawing a blank all of a sudden. Accepting when, like, the, that you don't control the market, right? Like at the end of the day, you can have a thesis and you can be right, right? Like you could, like you said, this company has fraud, the X, Y, Z, I'm short for these reasons that are all valid. Yeah. But things happen that are outside of your control all the time in the market, yeah. right? And to me, like I, I watch this so carefully for myself because I'm by nature impatient and kind of a hothead. And like, I've had to work on that over the years and I've gotten way better. But like, I think the worst case scenario is you take a trade, something outside of your control happens to where you lose money, but yeah. you're, and then you feel like the sense of entitlement or revenge against the market or like, oh, the market's out to get me. Yeah. But you have to understand like the only thing you have control over is your opinions and when you press buy and sell, right? Yeah. Like everything else is outside of your control. So if something like that happens, like I look at myself like this, I'm like, okay, that was an isolated incident. You didn't control that. Don't let that emotion spill over into other positions or let it bring you into like this downhill spiral. Yeah, that's super key. You don't wanna, you don't wanna feel like you're all of a sudden um, taking bigger chances on the next investment to try to make up for your loss. Yeah. Um, that, that will get you in a hole really, really quickly. You know, we, we actually would use our losses as case studies um, to try to help us improve for the future. So mm -hmm. being able to go back and study the the trades that you lost on or the investments that you whiffed on, yep. I think is a, a really helpful exercise. Um, so when you can go back and do that, I think that helps a lot uh, in terms of making you a better investor for the future. Awesome. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview. You know, again, it's very rare that you get somebody at Travis's level that's willing to share uh, that kind of information like he did. So thanks again to Travis for taking the time to do that interview. And thank you for taking the time to watch the entire interview. And if you're somebody who wants to take your mental game to the next level, I actually put two things together for you. So the first thing is a survey that's called the mental strength survey. 
survey, which will help you kind of figure out where you are as an investor or trader with your mental game. Are you a disciplined trader? Are you an emotion based trader? Are you a revenge investor? Right? There's different levels you could be at. And along with that, with the results of that survey, I put together a PDF uh, that's called the ultimate checklist to becoming a disciplined and confident trader or investor. So I'll go ahead and link that up here in the video and in the uh, description below. So feel free to go ahead and take that survey and read that document. I put a lot of time into that for you. And so again, I hope you got a ton of value from this interview and uh, go ahead and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so. And um, I'll look forward to seeing you in the next video. Take care.